Welcome to NVC Life. I'm Rochelle Lamb, veteran NVC trainer and relationship coach, helping listeners navigate interpersonal conflict and ground more deeply into relational living. Greetings, fellow humans. In today's episode, I read a piece that I wrote over three years ago on the subject of needs. I think it's always a good idea to revisit our own understanding of the word needs in the context of nonviolent communication. This article is titled, A Balanced Understanding of Needs. Please consider... If your narrative of the world and what constitutes a good life is peddled to you through a human-centric lens, you will almost inevitably view and understand needs through that same lens. You will devise strategies to meet your needs and the needs of those you care for while paying little heed to the needs of the non-human life upon which your human life is inarguably 100% dependent. The landscape falling off the edge of your lens will be barely visible to you. This, of course, doesn't mean that the landscape isn't there, even though you don't see it. In a sane and healthy culture, it's understood that it's far more important to instruct people on how to develop a deep relationship with the natural world than to have them focus on their personal needs. We can serve life best when we understand our role to be one of custodianship rather than subscribing to being customers and vendors. Being in right relationship with life is essential to all life. We accordingly have an obligation to first attend to the needs of life. Otherwise, we are all in peril. And yet, when we take a look around, Our behaviors reveal that, by and large, we are far more preoccupied with being customers and vendors than we are with being custodians and caretakers. In my 20 years of teaching nonviolent communication, I've become increasingly aware and disturbed at the insidiousness of the human-centric lens and how it compromises the capacity of NVC to contribute to enriching life in a genuinely deep, inclusive, and sustained way. The lenses through which we view the world invariably define the parameters and content of our conversations. Consequently, when our lens is human-centric, the very real needs of life beyond the human have no place to appear. How often does non-human life show up in conversations about social justice, resolving conflict, getting our children or employees to cooperate, etc.? Very rarely. Most disputes that I'm asked to provide support for in my work occur within physical and psychic spaces that are both created and dominated by predominantly human interests. The insularity of these spaces and equally insulated associated concerns are in most cases considerably removed from the past and present atrocities injustices, and exploitations that can be linked to the unhealthy and short-sighted detachment that insularity, in fact, facilitates and perpetuates. For instance, using NVC or other mediation processes, I could help dissenting associates reach an argument about what marketing strategies to adopt for a new service or product, while never once asking them to consider whether the product or their organization has consequences to the earth, to wildlife, or to future generations. My job as a mediating facilitator is to assist members come to a shared understanding about the needs they're attempting to satisfy within the context of their organizational mandate. It's not within my job description as a facilitator to question the organization's purpose. Sadly and tragically, professionalism, or as Marshall Rosenberg called it, bureaucratic language, underwrites a lot of inhumane and unethical decisions. I believe, however, that it's absolutely my job as an engaged citizen who cares about the health of the planet and its inhabitants to question 
any organization's purpose. Will I? Will you? Will we? And what price will be exacted for doing so? It turns out that our clamoring insistence to be seen, to be heard, to be understood, to be accepted and respected for our choices and our unique take on things, all of which are understood to be needs in NVC parlance, can occupy enormous amounts of our precious attention to the point of eclipsing our human obligation to life and to future generations. Even when we claim that love, peace, nonviolence, etc. are central to our conversations, those conversations typically remain human-centric. But what about the rest of the world? What about the rest of the world? It's worth repeating the following. In a sane and healthy culture, it's understood that it is far more important to instruct people on developing a deep relationship with the natural world than to have them focus on their personal needs. It was never made apparent to me as a child or later as an adult that my own well-being derived from the health of all that sustained me. It was never instilled in me that it remains both an individual and collective responsibility to make the needs of life a priority. Mostly, what has been sold to me by the dominant culture is the right I have to pursue the lifestyle that I choose irrespective of the needs of life. I have been taught that when things aren't going the way I want them to go, it's primarily because I am either not prioritizing my needs or not implementing effective strategies to fulfill them, or being deprived of them by external forces. It's so easy to come to NVC in search of ways to attend to one's own needs. How could it be otherwise when the most commonly trafficked understanding of needs is unbalanced and skewed in the direction of the human? And yet caring for our needs, while not to be entirely dismissed or considered wrong, simply does not encompass the realities of life on planet Earth and the mandatory obligation we have as citizens to recognize and nurture the reciprocal nature of our relationship with the natural world. Marshall Rosenberg wrote that our survival as a species depends on our ability to recognize that our well-being and the well-being of others are in fact one and the same. Surely others that he is referring to cannot simply mean human life. I don't think it would be a stretch to say that our survival as a species depends on our ability to recognize that our well-being and the well-being of all of life are, in fact, one and the same. When we fall out of right relationship with the very life force that sustains our own lives, we can expect to suffer as a result of the disconnection. Traumas, syndromes, mental illnesses, addictions, deep loneliness— Afflictions representing only a small part of the story and appearing on the surface to be symptomatic of our personal needs not being met can more accurately be understood as being symptomatic of the many sanctioned and normalized violences and ruptures that inform our daily way of life within the dominant culture. A few times in my workshops, I've been asked the following, Rochelle, what is humility? It's such a beautiful question. Oxford defines humility as the quality of having a modest or low view of one's importance. The idea of having a low view of one's importance doesn't fly too well for most people. We might be better served to turn to etymology. In this case, from humilis, lowly, humble, literally, on the ground, from humus, earth. Perhaps we could define humility more accurately as a measure of our relationship with the earth. We might say that humility is the abstinence of entitlement. It's knowing our place of belonging, belonging to the land, to the earth, to our kin, to the world. It's saying I'm here to be of service to the life that sustains all life instead of understanding the world as being here to serve me. 
What we do next seems quite clear. We must prioritize the needs of life and adjust our lifestyles, habits, and preferences accordingly. We must be willing to see the very real impact of our choices. We must turn to a life-centric lens and become the custodians we were meant to be. I will conclude this episode with a poem titled The Ward. Dominant culture has been admitted to palliative care. Tis a sobering time, and there are many crowded in the ward, some struggling with the news, others praying for a miracle, some angry that preventative measures weren't taken sooner, some researching the latest treatment for death and extinction, some running for office, others remembering the old stories, some dancing in private because human bodies need to feel aliveness. And let us remember those to whom a thousand thank yous are owed, laboring in the gardens, singing over the seeds, growing loaves and fishes, and weaving bolts of cloth because people still need to eat and be clothed, and beauty is medicine too. And there are small children, wide-eyed and curious, learning about the world, asking big questions. What's happening, Mom? Dad? Grandma, Grandpa, Aunt, Uncle, Neighbor, Responsible Citizens, what's happening? And the discerning elder, unwilling to speak falsely, whispers true and soft, Everything, my child, all the best and all the worst is what's happening. Thank you for tuning in to NBC Life. For future episodes, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. For free resources or to book a private session with me, head over to rochellelam.com. Until the next time, stay sane, grateful, and generous.